Welcome to Oncology Today, metastatic non-small cell lung cancer management in patients without actionable mutations. This is medical oncologist Dr. Neil Love. For this program, I met with Dr. Edward Garin from the David Geffen School of Medicine at the University of California, Los Angeles. In addition to this interview program, there's also a corresponding video featuring Dr. Garin's slide presentation. To begin, I asked him to paint a picture of what things were like in non-small cell lung cancer before immune checkpoint inhibitors arrived. It was 2015. The first approval was nivolumab in squamous cell carcinoma. Then there was an approval for pembrolizumab in PDL1 high, greater than 50% in previously treated patients uh, across histologies. And then shortly thereafter, there was the approval for nivolumab in a second line setting that was um, after chemotherapy in non squamous, non small cell lung cancer. So I think that. This is one of those moments for me that is, you know, intensely gratifying and one of the reasons I think that uh, it's particularly exciting to be a physician scientist. Um, you know, we were involved in many of these uh, clinical trials uh, that led to this, um, but the practical effect is really felt tremendously. My, my clinic looks totally different. Um, and in fact, I often discuss this when uh, new fellows come in every three or six months, uh, depending on their block uh, schedule, I'll get new fellows. And what I remember is that my, um, my rotation, for instance, in a lung cancer uh, clinic during fellowship was really a, a clinic about staging. Um, that was the main emphasis for a lung cancer clinic um, was how you evaluated stage of disease and management based on stage. And what's funny is we, we, we don't really talk about that so much in clinic right now. It is really more having to do with uh, sort of the, the molecular subgroups of the disease um, and immunotherapy and, um, you know, side effects uh, and management of immunotherapy. And um, one of the things that is so nice, when I started my career, um, I actually had two diseases that I treated. Um, I did lung cancer and I did pancreatic cancer. Those were my two diseases. And the clinics, in fact, looked quite similar. They were looking at, uh, you know, not particularly efficacious approaches, um, significant toxicity, and um, a lot of interaction with you know the hospice organizations, um, things like that. My clinic today looks tremendously different. Now, some of this is biased by the fact that the the people who do well, I see more for, more times because they've done well. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, there are a lot of patients in my clinic that you know, that my visits are more social visits in the infusion center uh, for people who are living a completely normal or, or essentially normal life outside of coming into the, the infusion center every few weeks. Um, and, and my clinic just didn't look anything like that um, prior to uh, the availability of putting patients on these agents. So, you know, one other, you know, aspect of the care of lung cancer that maybe hasn't got as much attention, but kind of seems like I hear a lot about it in oncology, all over oncology, is antibody drug conjugates. And we're going to talk a, a little bit about that today. But any, again, any thoughts about over the last five years or so? I mean, we're seeing it in, you know, everything from cervical cancer, multiple myeloma, bladder cancer, and of course now lung cancer. Any thoughts about ADCs and where they might be heading? Yeah, I, I think the 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 the, the, pract the the first practical thing I always think about is I had this slide that was in all all of my presentations that showed uh, the 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 Joan Schiller data set where they compared four different chemotherapy regimens right. through the cooperative group in the New England Journal of Medicine and they all looked the same, and the slide was entitled you know chemotherapy has reached its plateau. Um, I don't show that slide anymore. Um, in all fairness, we don't have this, the data yet to indicate that these agents are superior to our standard approaches in lung cancer specifically, um, based on, for instance, randomized data. Um, but having these agents in, in my hand in clinical trials, I'm very hopeful on the outcomes of some of these trials. I think that, um, we are seeing sort of a duration of response in particular with these agents that we have not typically seen with, uh, certainly with chemotherapy approaches in the salvage setting. 
So we'll get into that more uh, in your talk. Uh, and before you go through really an update of where we are in this uh, general issue, I just kind of wanted to go through a few general clinical issues, questions that come up all the time when I talk to general medical oncologists in community-based practice. And I see a lot of papers in your CV uh, looking at a lot of these issues. The first is where we are today in terms of biomarker assessment, particularly as it relates to IOs. I mean, what do you consider uh, the optimal workup for a patient presenting with metastatic disease? Is the workup different for a non-smoker or a smoker? I know I see you've had uh, looked in, the, you know, sort of a community-based setting in terms of what people are actually doing. Do you see gaps between what people do in practice and what investigators are doing? Can you comment a little bit about where we are right now with biomarker assessment, particularly as it relates to immunotherapy? So first I'll start with the one place where I think that, that sometimes in the community things are done differently and not in a good way. And that is, I think in the community there's, um, there's more of a push to treat with incomplete data, um, with respect to molecular studies and for instance to start somebody on, uh, for instance, chemoimmunotherapy. And if I look at the derivation, I think that, that it probably has a lot to do with the fact that in the community, unlike uh, at a major academic center where I really treat largely lung cancer, they're treating all sorts of diseases. And if you have someone who has lymphoma that is aggressive, to treat them quickly really matters. Um, and many of the therapies that you would give sort of span a whole host of different uh, uh, approaches. But I think there are significant differences. And, and um, although uh, I don't have it as a case that I present in, in this case, I oftentimes will present cases of a patient who started, for instance, chemoimmunotherapy, and then an EGFR mutation is identified. And it creates a real challenge. And there is no right answer as to what to do. Um, the prior immunotherapy has almost certainly increased the risk for that patient. Um, what I would say is that one of the things that uh, I think you certainly want to know is EGFR and ALK mutational status prior to starting any therapy. And in fact, our institution, we have set up a system where we get those two results back very quickly. Um, because among other things, our immunotherapy-based approaches are not a, even approved in that group of patients. Now, patients who have other genomic alterations um, for instance, may have been included in some studies like Keynote 189. And, and actually, the, the patients, for instance, who were non-smokers did, did perfectly fine in that study. Uh, but certainly, I think you, you want to know for EGFR and ALK very quickly before you start therapy. Um, for some of the other driver mutations, uh, I think that it is, uh, in some of them, you really would want to know. In some of them, I think it's still a question. Um, BRAF V600E, for instance, you would talk with different experts and they would disagree as to whether someone should start with targeted therapy or immunotherapy. Um, and I think that's true of some of the others. Um, I, I think that those are, are very true in, uh, non-squamous disease. Um, in squamous disease, the PDL1 is really the major, uh, driver of, of differentiation, unless you have someone who has unusual characteristics. Um, in, in my clinic, you know, in, on, on the West Coast at a major academic center, we definitely see patients who are non-smokers with squamous cell disease, and the great majority of them are driver mutation positive. Um, you know, but that's not what people are generally going to see in, in, in practice. Um, I think that uh, PDL1 has been uh, sort of much maligned, but it, it really remains the mainstay of our treatment approach. Um, and we've refined things somewhat clearly. High, particularly high levels are associated with um, great benefit. That is, if in outside of the driver mutation positive cases. Um, but I think it is important at least to know the EGFR and ALK status before starting uh, starting therapy on someone. And in an ideal world, certainly I'd also know ROS1. At, um, some of these other um, drivers that we don't anticipate being particularly uh, sensitive to immunotherapy approaches. Yeah, I saw a study uh, you did uh, getting into this issue of, you know, the fact that people in practice get kind of nervous, they don't have the data back, and they want to go ahead and get started with treatment. One of the things I've heard people talk about, and sometimes the patient needs to be treated, they're symptomatic from the disease, they, maybe they can't wait, but one of the things I've heard is the idea of in that kind of situation, uh, starting chemo but holding off on the IO until you, particularly you have EGFR and ALK uh, back. 
Any thoughts about that strategy? Yeah, that's certainly the strategy that I would typically, um, you know, use. I, I think that I, I'd have a hard time, you know, sort of saying someone did something wrong if you have a 120 pack year smoker, um, you know, who uh, you have a very low likelihood. Although sometimes those patients will come back with an EGFR mutation, but I think that with in anyone in whom you think you have a reasonable likelihood of having uh, one of these driver mutations, um, I would definitely not give immunotherapy with cycle one. So just a couple other sort of global uh, questions that, you know, really been out there for a while, but just to kind of get an update on because they're so important. One is the management of the patient with a high PD-1 level and whether to give chemotherapy. You know, in the, you know, when this first question first came out, I heard people really focus on symptomatology of the patient. Did the patient need a response? I'm curious where you are today in terms of that question. Um, is it, and is it different, for example, in an older than younger patient? Yeah, so I usually do tend to give single agent uh, PD-1 inhibition in patients who uh, have a high PD-L1, although there are nuances there. Um, I feel more confident if the PD-L1 is 90% than if it's exactly 50%, for instance. One group that I'm reluctant to give single agent uh, therapy to is in is in patients who have not been smokers. Um, they that group has been underrepresented in some studies in the semiplumab, uh, you know, uh, monotherapy study. They weren't even uh, they they were excluded. Um, patients had to have had a smoking history. Um, but if you look at the data sets, they are a little more concerning in terms of whether that group really benefits as much. And so that's a group where I do tend to use uh, chemoimmunotherapy. There are a few young patients where I have said that, you know, we're, we're waiting on a big cooperative group study that will answer this question about chemo IO versus IO in the frontline setting. Um, but in the interim, there are some patients younger, maybe early 50s, where I've, I've said, you know, I, I think it's unlikely that immunotherapy alone is going to prove to be better than chemoimmunotherapy. And I think the toxicity burden for you is going to be, you know, particularly low because of your young age. And so there are patients where we've had uh, more of a discussion about whether to start with single agent or chemoimmunotherapy. But I would still say that probably three quarters of my PDL1 high patients do start with immunotherapy alone. Speaking of IO monotherapy, any preference? I mean, most people, I think, end up using pembrolizumab because, you know, maybe they're more used to it. But you do have three agents out there to choose from. Any preference at all? Any difference? And also, any difference that you see in data with PDL1 versus PD1 uh, antibodies? So, um, I think it's a little bit hard to make broad generalizations across the class um, between PD-1 and PDL1. Um, although, uh, you know, certainly the, uh, you know, I would say that the most favorable data sets in non-small cell lung cancer, um, it, at least using either, you know, monotherapy or combinations with uh with chemotherapy and immunotherapy have been with PD-1 inhibitors. Um, in terms of preference, I must admit I do generally use pembrolizumab. I have great familiarity with it um, over time. When I look at the semiplumab data, I find it to be, you know, in my estimation when I look at it, essentially equivalent um, to the pembrolizumab. Um, and uh, I would have no problem using it and, and for instance, bring on a study that would use semiplumab as the PD-1 backbone um, along with a, a, another agent, and I, I feel very comfortable with that. Um, the, the one agent that also is approved that, uh, and, and I will show the data in the slide later, that I have a little bit more of a mixed opinion on is, is the atezolizumab data set. So that, as a frontline data set, um, was a positive data set in pd one 50% or greater. Um, but interestingly, the data hasn't held up very well over time. And, um, and unlike the updates that we see with pembrolizumab or semiplumab, um, there's some concern that the, that at least, you know, if you start looking out a few years, that the survival benefit really disappears. And, and I, I sometimes when talking with the fellows have said, you know, if, if you follow people long enough, we'll all be dead. Um, so there is some risk in looking at longer term outcomes. 
But on the other hand, there's a little bit of concern that, that at least the um, robust survival advantage that we've seen long term with, uh, with some of the other agents we haven't necessarily seen in that atezolizumab monotherapy group. Also curious uh, whether that patients get uh, IO alone or with chemo, if a patient with a high PD-1 level says, is there a chance that I might be cured, how do you respond? You know, I think, interestingly, my patients never ask me if they're cured. I think they, <laughs> we have a sophisticated patient population and they know enough to know that, that, that I can't tell them. The one thing that I would say that is a little bit interesting is we were fortunate to be involved, as I say, with some of the, the earliest of the pembrolizumab studies. And so we are um, hitting the point where, where we're near the point of having several 10-year survivors um, you know, from uh, pembrolizumab. Interestingly, most of those patients have had a, like, a radiation event or a, 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 an ablation event. Um, so what does that mean exactly? I, I don't know. Um, what I do know is that their life is completely different than they would have been before these agents. Um, but I think we just don't know what the answer to that is. I think that um, that the most we can hope for is durable response. And um, it, and this may not sound like a real positive, but it is. I'm definitely in my clinic starting to see people who die of something else. And um, although, again, that may not sound like a cause for celebration, we sort of all know the deal. Everybody's going to die eventually. Um, and so the best that I can do is have them not die of the thing that I'm managing or because of a complication of that. And that's definitely ha starting to happen in my clinic where, where lung cancer is on the problem list. And that was never the case um, before. And, and when you asked earlier about how my clinic is different, I didn't really interact with much with the primary care physicians. My colleagues in breast cancer used to have um, sort of, you know, ongoing uh, collaborative relationships with the patient's primary care physician. And when I took over somebody's care, it really was taking over. Um, the, the primary care physician was done and it was my issue now because their problem was lung cancer. And, and that's starting to change. And, and that's, that's really an, an exciting thing. Really is. Just a couple other uh, general questions I want to bring up. One is the, and I know you're going to get into this, but I just want to start out with more of a global because I, you know, we hear, we've heard lots of data or a fair amount of data over the last few years about the issue of anti CTLA4 plus PD1, initially Ipi Nevo, now more recently, particularly Aderva Tremi. And I'm curious right now, in general, outside a clinical trial, in what situations, if any, do you think about a combination like that? And also, in general, again, it's sort of a macro view of toxicity, ipinevo, the way it's being given in lung cancer trials, and dervatremi. So I must admit, admit that the CTLA-4 inhibition has been a great frustration to me. And the reason it's a frustration is that... Um, I tend to be a bit of a purist on clinical trials. I do sometimes teach essentially in the clinical trials 101. And I mean, it's not called that, but, but essentially what would be considered clinical trials 101. And the way to show whether a drug is efficacious is really simple. You randomize people to either get that drug or not get that drug and show that when they get that drug, they do better. Um, this isn't complicated. It's standard. And we've never designed studies to, to do that with CTLA-4 inhibition. It's a significant frustration and has greatly limited uh, my use of CTLA-4 inhibitors as a result because I can't isolate or even talk to patients about what the anticipated benefit is. So when am I most likely to use them? Um, I think that one place where I have been inclined to use them is for instance, in somebody who has progressed, uh, and, and this may change over time, although maybe not b based on the fact that the approvals for um, adjuvant uh, immunotherapy are really in patients who are pd one positive. But so, for instance, if somebody progresses very rapidly after um, you know, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, um, the likelihood of going to uh, a chemoimmunotherapy immunotherapy 
Um, you know, at that point, platinum-based chemotherapy plus pembrolizumab, for instance, uh, maybe simiplumab. I think the likelihood of benefit there is extremely low if they have a, you know, like a, a PDL one of zero, for instance. Um, so I think those are places where I do consider CTLA four inhibition. I'm not absolutely sold on the benefit because I still haven't seen that sort of trial that that definitively shows that this is an efficacious class of drugs. But in somebody who's already gotten chemotherapy who doesn't really have biomarkers that are suggestive of a benefit benefit from uh, single agent immunotherapy. That's a situation I think to look for either clinical trials or um, in, in an absence of a lot of data, something that might incorporate a CTLA-4 inhibitor. Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, thought. What about the difference, you know, indirectly as you see it uh, in the way ipinevo plays out in terms of toxicity versus dervitremi? So I think that the main difference when one looks at um, at the two study regimens is the duration of each agent. So in the uh, the for instance the the Checkmate Nine LA regimen, um, the nivolumab and ipilimumab uh, are are given over time, but the the chemotherapy is only two cycles. Um, there is more chemotherapy in the Poseidon regimen, which is the dervalumab and trembolumab. Um, but the, there's only one, uh, after the initial sort of four cycles, there's, there's one additional uh, tremi cycle. I think that uh, certainly there is toxicity associated with CTLA-4 inhibition. Um, and I, I think that, you know, if you were to, to talk to people in general, you'd say, well, to get the, to have the CTLA-4 inhibition stop earlier might reduce toxicity. Although I, I don't know that it's that easy to prove that in cross-trial comparisons. Um, one, obvious cross-trial comparisons are, are, are never the, sort of the gold standard for evaluation. But also, I don't know that if you looked at those, you would say, oh, it, it, there's a huge disparity in the tolerability. So one final question, again, one that you know we've been asking for a long time. I was curious where we are today, which is the correlation, if any, uh, with autoimmune toxicity and treatment benefit using IOs. So do people who get autoimmune toxicity have greater uh, benefit? So yeah, so we've actually published on this issue um, and there are a lot of publications. Most of them, I would argue, are not particularly good. And the reason they're not particularly good is there's a significant bias in these analyses. And that is that the longer one is on a drug, the more likely one is to have a toxicity for that drug. So that somebody who gets you know, three cycles of a PD-1 inhibitor every three weeks and then goes off therapy is much less likely to have a toxicity because they were only on therapy for a couple months. So the best analyses do adjust for that. Um, I think even when you adjust for it, there is some evidence, and, and we found this, of some um, improved outcome among patients who had an autoimmune toxicity. And there's some theoretical reason to um, imagine it. Um, I, I've always been a little bit skeptical of this. We used to say this a lot in the patient population uh, with EGFR inhibitors, um, that the patients who got the rash did the best. I think there were some confounders there with smoking history and things like that. Um, but I would say that, that if, if you were to ask me to sort of evaluate the literature across the board, I would say that in a well-conducted study, there is a modest increase in likelihood of benefit from somebody who experiences an autoimmune toxicity. So one final question again for the new people to oncology. Uh, could you roughly estimate how many people in your practice have metastatic non-small cell lung cancer and are alive five years later? So that's an excellent question, and, and obviously you're asking for an estimate. Um, so when we did the uh, sort of update on the Keynote 001 uh, study at five years, the number was 15%. I think across um, you know driver mutations, it probably also is that. I think there are some improvements coming over time. So I would say that in reality, in my clinic, at least one in five patients with metastatic disease um, is going to be alive um, five years out. And, um, and if you asked me to guess, um, what somebody diagnosed today is, um, I would say it would be somewhere between 25 and, and 30% based on improvements in some of the, uh, agents that are coming. And, and I think if you were to ask me to, to pick out one group in particular, I know we'll get to it. It would be the antibody drug conjugates. All right. Let's talk about your cases. Uh, what happened with this 76 year old lady? <laughs> 
Yeah, so this is a, a case that uh, was interesting. This is, um, I picked the patient up a little bit midstream um, and may have ma- managed a little differently from the outset, but certainly not better than what the outcome has been. Um, so this was patient at the time of diagnosis was 76 years old, had multiple comorbidities, including a 15-year history of CLL. The CLL was manageable, but also not completely indolent. It had, she had required uh, a, a few different uh, treatments over the years. Uh, she presented with non-small cell lung cancer. It was adenocarcinoma with a KRSG 12 a mutation, um, had pleural effusion and extensive bone metastasis and low uh, pd one expression. Um, the practitioner who originally treated started single-agent pembrolizumab, um, which, is, again, as I mentioned, based on that Keynote 042 data is uh, an approved approach. And um, the patient, in fact, has done very well. Um, I think that um, this is a situation where perhaps the, the practitioner who had treated the patient successfully for CLL over long periods of time was very concerned about the blood counts, as one might imagine. And so the single agent uh, drug was uh, effective. This patient is now... Um, you know, about five years out and has had slow evidence of progression, some of which we've been able to treat with localized therapy. Um, so uh, unfortunately, I don't think she's going to be part of the group that I mentioned who end up dying of something else. I do think it will eventually be the lung cancer, but also she will be part of that group, as I say, that is alive more than five years after the diagnosis of metastatic disease. Um, and so, um, you know, not a complete victory in terms of management, but I would say at least a, a partial victory that we um, have been able to get to the patient to the five-year mark, most of that with quite good quality. What an amazing case. Is she still on Pembro? She is, although I think that over time, you know, this always becomes a question in some of these where you try sort of treating individual lesions. At what point do you cross over um, to really a systemic progression versus a, a bunch of oligometastatic? It's probably for a different uh, a different session that you that you lead. Um, but but the patient still is on pembrolizumab, uh, but has required sort of more radiation type approaches over time. I was going to ask you about other uh, checkpoint inhibitors. You know, melanoma, we have rel- relatimab. Um, is there any research going on on, you know, sort of secondary, I don't know what you would call them, secondary checkpoint inhib- inhibitors, uh, like the way they're looking at melanoma? Yeah, I think those have been explored, um, and there are even large, fairly large efforts that are looking at these. Um, to date, we haven't had any definitive data yet that, that has uh, convinced us that these are going to be um, incorporated. Um, there clearly have been differences between um, between melanoma and lung cancer, certainly. Um, although, as we talked about earlier, the, the, the role of CTLA-4 inhibition is um, somewhat debated. As monotherapy, we know we, we have some patients who do extraordinarily well with CTLA-4 inhibition. Um, in melanoma, at least historically, that was seen. We don't see the same thing um, in right. lung cancer, for instance. So um, she has a, a KRAS G12A mutation, and you were kind of getting into that uh, in your talk, can you kind of just globally summarize that? Is it uh, what specific KRAS uh, mutations seem to be predictive of benefit, and then what sub mutations or additional mutations? Like, in what situations are they? Do you look at it and go, "Oh, this patient's probably not going to do as well"? Yeah. So obviously in the sort of new treatment landscape where we have uh, specific inhibitors of KRAS G12C. We sometimes describe KRS mutations as G12C or non-G12C. Um, I would say that we don't have any clear data on, um, on that. The one group that doesn't seem to do as well as the people who have more of a mucinous, uh, type adenocarcinoma. Um, that group has not generally done quite as well, uh, it, well, it really has not done as well on immunotherapy approaches. And then again, this is the setting in which SDK11 mutations or KEEP1, uh, mutations also have been associated with particularly poor outcomes. Now that particularly poor outcome data is really from monotherapy. I don't know that we have as substantial data set when one looks at things like chemoimmunotherapy.
And there is some suggestion, for instance, from the Poseidon study, that the patients who had uh, SDK11 and KEEP1 mutations did did better when you added the CTLA4 inhibition. And that may be a group uh, for which CTLA4 inhibition has um, particular benefit. And, and I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll start to see clinical trials that are specifically addressing and assessing this. Did this uh, woman have an objective response? Um, yes. But partial? Correct. When you look at people who've gotten IOs who get out to five years, what fraction of them have CRs? Um, almost none of the lung cancer patients have complete responses. And when I describe this to the patients, because they obviously are always disappointed, they want to see everything go away. And what I always explain to them is that um, no matter how good a drug is, you know, it's not likely to regenerate normal lung architecture. And so um, over the years, we have had indication, for instance, to biopsy some of these residual masses. Some of them just look like scars. Some of them are active cancer. I sometimes describe it as that the immunotherapy sort of worked it to a draw. And um, sometimes that maybe that's good enough. So she's never had the symptoms. She still has a pleural fusion? No, the pleural effusion has has um, has improved, and and one of the problems that uh, now it's been more uh, adrenal uh, metastases that have been an issue. Hmm, interesting. Okay, how about your fifty six year old man? Yeah, so this is a fifty six year old man, a long smoking history, even despite the young age. Uh, patient presented with squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. PDL one was uh, was low at five percent. Uh, tumor mutation burden was. Uh, was high, but not sort of meeting that 10 uh, mutations per megabase. That there were no uh, identifiable mutations because, again, the patient did, uh, you know, have a, a NGS testing, and the patient was actually referred for enrollment in the Poseidon trial. As I mentioned, we did have the Poseidon trial. Um, this is a, a patient who, um, who unfortunately didn't really benefit from the trial. And one of the things that I think, um, when one looks at the data from the Poseidon trial. Um, the squamous cell carcinoma patients didn't do particularly well here. Um, and it's a little bit hard to know. Um, when one looks at the group that got gemcitabine as their sort of second chemotherapeutic, um, in addition to platinum agent, um, is a group that didn't do particularly well. And, um, you know, whether or not it's that the gemcitabine is acting as a surrogate for uh, squamous cell disease or squamous cell disease is acting as a surrogate for gemcitabine as a partner, I think it's a little bit hard to know. But empirically, um, this person uh, did receive the combination of uh, carboplatin, gemcitabine, um, and both of the uh, immunotherapeutics um, and really didn't have any, any real benefit. What uh, happened in terms of tolerability, autoimmune issues? Yeah, so the tolerability was was okay. And um, one of the things, and I, I think we tend to forget this, is that uh, the tolerability of lung cancer isn't all that good. And so um, in this case, the patient's um, quality of life certainly diminished over time based on um, their course, but really it was not based on the drugs themselves, but really based on the disease. And that, um, like is often the case, unfortunately, in this case, um, the to tolerability issues were based on, on sort of uh, lack of efficacy rather than uh, tolerability issues. When you, uh, I know you've published, I saw a paper you did on thyroid abnormalities with IOs, of course, very common. What is the spectrum that you generally see of IO toxicity? How do you uh, monitor for uh, thyroid and what do you see clinically thyroid? I've heard both hyper and a hypo. So we occasionally see hyperthyroid that eventually burns out sort of to hypothyroidism. Um, the one thing, and, and I think you mentioned this in, in the paper by, by Aaron Lisberg, my colleague, um, you know, from, from our group, um, that I think was, uh, you know, particularly interesting, um, is that our electronic medical record and, uh, sort of prescribing stuff is all set up that while somebody's getting their immunotherapy, we routinely check their, their thyroid function tests. Um, the problem is that once they stop, they move on to another therapy, we no longer check it because that's not how the builds for everything else are in, in our electronic medical record. And so 
we found sort of a disappointingly low rate of continuing to follow for thyroid abnormalities. And um, this is a concern to me, par- particularly because a lot of the symptoms of hypothyroidism are very similar to just sort of the symptoms of someone who's failing from cancer. And so I do worry that there are some patients who were basically sending to hospice for hypothyroidism. Wow. That's scary. So, I don't know I that mean, the numbers are huge, but I think it's real. That's what I was going to ask you. I mean, how often do you see hypothyroidism that's delayed, you know, say more than a couple of years? Well, you don't generally see it more than a couple of years. But the problem is that if you look at the peak for hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism generally presents after that. And so, the, and so, in fact, you'll look at this. If you look across studies, the rate of hypothyroidism is, is I would argue, highly correlated with um, the duration that patients spend on study. Because, again, somebody who progresses after three months, you, you're generally not going to pick that hypothyroidism up. That's such an interesting and important point. I've never heard anybody make that point. I mean, most people progress through IOs, right? Correct. And so I think it's important to remember that some of these toxicities can be delayed and that thyroid, in fact, if you look, someone who progresses on their initial therapy, you would expect that their hypothyroidism would probably start after they've stopped immunotherapy. Such an interesting point. You know, plus every other, I mean, thyroid's common, but colitis, pneumonitis, I guess theoretically they could also occur after the th- therapy stopped. They can, and, and that's again, when, when we discussed earlier about the withholding the checkpoint inhibitor in patients who you don't have full genomic abnormalities, that's what the concern is, that we clearly have seen higher risk uh, when somebody gets a TKI after um, an immune checkpoint inhibitor. As long as you brought that up, I, you know, I've heard about this data, you know, for example, EGFR, you know, TKIs, but, you know, do you see that with other TKIs, you know, uh, Dibrafenib, uh, Met, you know, RET, all these, uh, do you see that? You see it some, it's different uh, events with, with each. Um, so, for instance, uh, Osimertinib, it's really been uh, lung to- toxicity. Uh, Crizotinib, it's been hepatic toxicity largely. Um, there are some reports that are starting to indicate for some of these other TKIs as well. Um, the one that I think that so far things have been a little bit better on has been um, some of the uh, BRF inhibitors. We have a large data set on that, obviously, for melanoma. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. All right, last case, 63-year-old woman. Okay, so this is a, an interesting case um, because so it's a 63 year old woman, um, history of non small cell lung cancer with a LA58R mutation in EGFR, um, was diagnosed with a malignant pleural effusion. Patient received um, erlotinib, um, eventually ended up going to osimertinib, then osimertinib and a MET directed uh, antibody drug conjugate. The, the payload there was not a uh, deruxtecan. Um, then the patient went on to receive uh, platinum based chemotherapy. Patient also received a, a study that included pembrolizumab. So that, I guess, is five prior lines of therapy. Eight years into her disease course, she enrolls on a trial of datapotamab deruxtecan. And um, the patient went into the trial and um, had substantial uh, pain and uh, and also a cough. And those symptoms have really resolved. The patient's now, um, you know, about six months into treatment on uh, data potomab drugs you can, has had a partial response, is doing extremely well clinically. Any tolerability issues? Any stomatitis? Um, Minor stomatitis, um, also hair loss. Um, this is one of the things that's been a little frustrating with this agent is that most people, in my experience, have not lost their hair, but particularly um, petite women have tended to lose their hair, which often is a group that's particularly uh, unenthusiastic about losing their hair. Um, but but she has uh, lost hair, but, but she's perfectly content in that situation um, to have disease control. And when you asked earlier about the, the five-year um, outcomes, this is someone who, again, I mean, continues to have disease, uh, you know, is not cured of their disease. But um, if you had to ask me, I think it's likely that this will be someone who 
goes out 10 years plus with uh, metastatic disease, which, you know, would have seemed un, un, you know, unthinkable when I started in, in practice. It's interesting, too, when you think about it, because she's got an EGFR activating mutation. I'm, granted, it was she's been through all kinds of therapy, but I presumably, I guess she still has it. You showed the data that, you know, you did looking at uh, data of DXD and people with targetable mutations. It looks like it works the same. I guess you could sort of visualize it like chemotherapy, uh, but, um, you know, may hopefully maybe see uh, more responses as occurred with this lady, really interesting. Any thoughts? I mean, you could, you know, you talked about the study comparing it to docetaxel's second line. You would think, you know, that, you know, we'll see what the data shows, but that clinical situation, hopefully it'll be positive because we really only need something there. But in the EGFR activating space, there's all kinds of things going on. Granted, this lady is kind of farther down the line, but any thoughts about where data is going to fit in there in spite of all the drawing, you know, looking for other mutations, MET, and all this other stuff, I'm kind of wondering whether or not something like this might actually be better. Yeah, no, I think that that's true. I think that it's it's always interesting because um, we we tend to associate targeted therapies with with duration of response. But again, if you look at that, uh, you know, the data on datapotamab deroxidecan. Um, your duration of response of 10 months or so is pretty respectable. Um, and that was again in a true sort of salvage situation. So, um, I think that you're right. Uh, um, in terms of what our enthusiasm is, um, we tend to be enthusiastic about, for instance, dual checkpoint inhibition, um, you know, modifying the immune response, things like that. But in the end, you know, what I have to tell my patients is, you know, look, I, you know, there are things that I'm scientifically interested in, but, but in my clinic, um, you know, I want people to live longer and feel good. And I don't really care that much what the mechanism is as long as it achieves those goals. One other issue, and I, I saw this um, as relates to TDXD, I kind of never thought too much about the issue of dose. You know, I think about ADCs, I don't know, it kind of seems like targeted therapy. Yet the more I think about it, the more it seems like chemotherapy. But with TDXD, I've seen some data, including in lung, about dose, like I think if you have a higher dose with TDXD, you just get more toxicity, uh, no additional benefit. What about with uh, data DXD? What do we know about dose? Uh, you know, the other question is, you know, in a frail patient, w would you ever consider a lower starting out with a lower dose of an ADC? Yeah. So the the answer is right now these are on clinical trials, so you have to start people at whatever the clinical trial says. That being said, I would challenge you to, sh to look at that data that I showed from the original datapotamab uh study um, and, and tell me why 6 milligrams per kilogram, which is the dose that's being evaluated in randomized trial, it was the dose selected rather than 4 milligrams per kilogram. So I would have no hesitation. And in fact, um, uh, although we're not discussing it, um, I did do that with uh, trastuzumab deroxidecan in a patient with a HER2 mutation the other day. The patient is uh, received multiple prior therapies, has a HER2 mutation, and is 90 years old. Um, so I did start basically at the first dose reduction, and you know was quite nervous about how things would go. Um, you know, patients both 90 years old and 90 pounds, and um, I was uh, you know uh, quite concerned and. Um, they came in, you know, a few weeks in, like it was nothing. <laughs> but, you know, they, their tolerability was was unbelievable, and um, you know, I think that that you know that's sort of uh, nice to see. I don't know that you can count on that, but yes, I definitely have um, co comfort in going with a reduced dose, and um, particularly when it looks at, at data of hanumab deroxidecan, um, I would have no hesitation based on the data we have available. If I had um, someone at, at, in an elderly age group or more lim limited performance tests, to start at that four milligram per kilogram dose. Yeah, I never really thought about it, but we did a lung cancer webinar recently where I started out with two cases that we uh, had presented at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Meeting of a 90-year-old and a 91-year-old woman with, with metastatic breast cancer. And the doc 
Started out both of them at a low dose. They tolerated totally fine. He escalated up. They were fine. They both responded. Symptomatic responses. You never would imagine it. But I never thought about the idea of dose as related to ADC. But I guess in a way, it's kind of chemo, huh? That's the way I think about it operationally. We did a presentation recently on the issue of disparities in oncology. I noticed that you had... um, a paper looking at the issue, and I don't know how much you're involved, whether your name was just on it, but I thought it was really interesting about translation of informed consent. And I was wondering whether or not that actually could be, you know, kind of part of a disparity of the issue. Yeah, so you know, maybe less people paper. are going on trials. We do have a paper, uh, it's for my group being, it, it's currently in review, but um, uh, I, I think we can state it's, it's, an, it's been posted as part of uh, the open review process because I, I think that particularly with this sort of data, um, I do want people to have access to it. So um, it's Marie Velez who is part of my group. And um, what motivated this is that um, obviously uh, Los Angeles, which is where where I, I live in practice um, is approximately fifty percent Hispanic, and um, our cancer center, although making you know major efforts to try and increase clinical trial enrollment in those populations, um, I, I, we're falling short, and um, that's something that we want uh, very much to improve. And so, what that paper is looking at is specifically on um, studies that are not funded by industry, um, and. And the issue is that if I have a study with a, an industry sponsor, I can pass along the cost of translation. But if I don't have an industry sponsor, um, I need to use the same pot of money that I would use to pay my staff, pay myself, um, you know, buy um, reagents for, for research, um, things like that. And um, my concern was that um, if that happens, one might imagine that people would be less likely to offer studies to people in whom um, translation was required. And that um, is, in fact, uh, unfortunately what we did find in our study. Now, I say unfortunate, but um, the the fortunate thing about that is my hope is that with the eventual publication of this data, um, uh, that there will be greater recognition of, uh, of this. And I, I think it's logical if you, if you make it sort of financially disadvantageous to an investigator to enroll a certain group of patients, it, it isn't particularly surprising that that group would be enrolled less. And I think as a society, we want to uh, avoid um, situations where we would basically be disincentivized from enrolling certain populations of patients, and and I'm, I'm hopeful that paper, you know, will be published, uh, you know, in in full form fairly soon, um, and that um, it will be able to start a discussion about how we can set up our our trial system so that it does. Uh, align with what our stated goals are, which is enrolling a patient population that is reflective of the, the population we treat. Do you know, I, I know there's this omnibus bill or something that you, new clinical trials have to have, I think, a minority or disparity plan. Do you know anything about that? And uh, do, uh, do you have any thoughts yourself about like what kind of disparity plan you would put together in a trial? Yeah, so I think it's an interesting question. And so uh, in terms of the, this particular legislation, it's not something I'm familiar with. And um, you know, I give a lot of credit to Dr. Velez, who's been leading this effort from my group, um, because she's been the one who's been more interested in this. And, and in my group, it actually it started by, um, we have an interest, my federal funding, for instance, comes in uh, in, in looking at, at basically biomarkers response to immunotherapy. And one of the things is that we've been looking at is particularly these motif new epitopes. And we had an effort that was trying to show that um, that basically you'll you'll see less of these motif new epitopes in carcinogenesis because the immune system will select against them. And we said, well, if we can if we can look for for absence of a particular epitope, uh, mutational epitope, um, shouldn't we be able to to, to do, use the same sort of approach to figure out why we're not getting the enrollment of um, certain populations that we think we should, and and that's what's what's generated that. And and so um, I think that my overall view is that if we think this is important, which we do, 
we should set up the economics of it so that it is that it is at least not disadvantageous to enroll patients from these populations on our trials. This concludes our program. Special thanks to Dr. Garin, and thank you for listening. This is Dr. Neil Love for Oncology Today.